needs to be done. We have a very, very great panel of speakers here that I'm going to introduce to you. But just before I do that, uh, I'd like to give you a quick brief about what this panel is going to speak about. So we all know that there's a critical need for angel investing and early stage financing in Africa, especially in sectors beyond technology. And this panel is going to bring together um, some angel investors, both from Africa and as well as outside of Africa, who have been investing, who are looking very actively to invest, uh, to discuss what they think the landscape looks like and what needs to be done to encourage more money into the space. So without further ado, let me call upon Atreya Rayaprolu, who is the director of IntelliCap's investment banking team and who will be the moderator for today's discussion. Uh, to join him on stage, can I invite Ranjit Cherikal, Head Africa Sales, Nokia Siemens Network. Um, Suzanne Bigel, Senior Advisor at Clearly So. Eric Osiakwan, the co-founder of Angel Africa. And Duncan Onyango, the Director of Acumen Fund in East Africa. Over to you, Atria. I'll uh, start off the panel with, uh, uh, can you hear me? for the panel discussion, really. So uh, I'm one of the founding members of IntelliCap, named Atreya, uh, and uh, had the investment banking practice there. So over the last uh, seven to eight years, uh, we have actually facilitated a uh, lot of investments into Indian enterprises, Im impact enterprises, close to 50 of them, and uh, have uh, dealt with uh, a spectrum of investors on one side, individual investors, uh, DFIs, impact investors, mainstream venture capital investors, private equity investors, and on the other side have actually engaged uh, with enterprises who are at seed stage uh, with almost no revenue at all, and uh, leading up to even companies uh, close to around $100 million in revenue. So over the years, uh, we have had, I mean, uh, one particular point of learning really across the years. And that's been to do with uh, the gap that we have seen in early stage funding in Indian enterprises. And, uh, and we have seen a lot of capital. We have seen a lot of uh, institutional investors emerge over the last five to seven years, especially in early stage and C stage as well. Uh, however, we still see that most of that capital is actually Series A or Series B. And what... Uh, venture capitalists call as venture capital is not actually is not actually seed stage or venture capital but mostly growth and venture stay, venture growth and uh, that's actually led us uh, over a period of time to set up our own network of investors and uh, uh, what we call the intellicap impact investors network which is uh, iq ben uh, one of the learnings that we have had is uh, domestic hni capital is, uh, uh, is, is, is one form of capital which can actually, uh, is, is probably the most appropriate for the kind of enterprises and for the kind of stage that we are talking about. So given the nature and the size of investment, we feel that domestic h &I capital can not only provide that capital, which otherwise cannot be provided by other institutional investors, but also can bring with it a whole lot of expertise, a whole lot of relationships, and of course, an ability to create linkages, market linkages across the value chain to help scale these enterprises up. 
In addition, what we feel is if we have to scale the concept of impact investing beyond that uh, of a niche uh, area, we would definitely have to engage with uh, retail investors in a more ongoing and sustainable manner. And we think they are an integral part of the entire ecosystem. So that's actually led us to create this and set up this uh, set up IQBEN, which is IntelliCap's investor network. And uh, today, uh, over the last two years, we started this in 2011. We have uh, 50 uh, investors and partners, uh, some of them domestic uh, HNI, some of them international HNIs, and some of them institutional early stage and seed stage funds. And uh, we also have some certain high quality service providers who are part of this ecosystem. So uh, having actually uh, built this over the last couple of years, we have now facilitated close to six transactions. And uh, 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 we have actually interacted with a whole lot of stakeholders within Africa uh, over the last one year. Entrepreneurs, uh, institutional investors like VCs, and uh, incubators and accelerators as well. And uh, what we find interesting is uh, that the learning here and the observations here are absolutely similar and very, very identical to what we have found in India. And uh, uh, we thought we, we should actually come up with a discussion on, on the angel in investing landscape out here and how we can actually take certain learnings from our international markets and see if we can adopt certain models to catalyze the entire angel, angel investing uh, uh, space out here in Africa. So uh, without further delay, uh, let me actually start off with a circle of introductions. I will actually let each of the panel members introduce themselves. We have a, a distinguished group of panelists who have uh, had significant, significant experience investing both in and out of Africa. And uh, it is best that I let them introduce themselves and talk about the landscape of angel investing that they have seen. I will start off with Suzanne. Hi, I'm Suzanne Beagle, and I'm here wearing a couple of hats. Um, one is that I run an angel network in the UK, which started in 2012, called Clearly Social Angels. And we are part of a corporate finance advisory house that helps entrepreneurs get ready for capital and raise capital, and helps investors really find the right entrepreneurs based on their sector, stage, geography, um, impact theme, interest. So we're really focused on social and environmental types of businesses and social enterprises, some of which are very, very commercial, and some of which are uh, much more kind of social enterprises that are closer to a nonprofit model. Um, and our investors are uh, a mix, and so I'll talk more about that. My own background, I was an entrepreneur, started actually at IBM, worked for two IBM spin-outs, then I had a a business in the e-learning space, which I grew and sold, became an angel investor, um, and I'm kind of typical of the profile of some angels who are that you know built a business, sold it, and then said, "How do I both pay it forward and uh, get involved in this sector uh, to be supportive, but also to uh, make money?" And um, I've been running clearly social angels, but before that, I was running a group in the states called Investor Circle which I've been a member of for about 10, 12 years, and that's the oldest and largest impact investing network focused on, again, sustainability and social impact. It's over 20 years old at this point. Um, so I've been an entrepreneur, I've been on the investor side, um, and in terms of Africa, my connection is I'm an investor in a venture fund called Grassroots Business Fund, but I'm also um, looking at deals increasingly that are either UK-based that are coming here, um, or they may be Africa-based that are coming to the UK or coming to the UK to raise money. So lots of things that we can talk about, about how we can be mutually supportive. Thanks, Suzanne. Uh, my name is Ranjit Cherkal. I'm, I'm based, I live in Nairobi. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm a fairly active angel investor. I don't actually work for Nokia Siemens anymore. I quit, quit that six, six months ago. I spend most of my time running a technology accelerator based in Nairobi, Cape Town, and we're building our third site in Lagos. It's called 88 miles per hour. For, for those of you that are, that are here, we'll, you'll probably know about it. Um, we invest in 15 to 20 tech startups in, in across these two sites, and hopefully third by the end of the year. We give typically between 25 to $100,000 to a young Kenyan, South African, Nigerian, Ghanaian, 
to build a tech company which will hopefully be in the lease of dimension data, so on and so forth. We've had a fairly good uh, view of what's happened in the market the last few years. I've seen quite a few companies die. But we've also seen some companies to, to, to go on to make actually some interesting strides, uh, which I've not seen in other parts of the world. Uh, an example is one of our companies is now currently raising $25 million in secondary funding uh, by the, uh, for which they've got uh, about 80% commitment. So um, I have a ringside view on what happens in tech and investments uh, here. On a personal note, I, I've lived most of my life around the world, but uh, more than 60% of that is in Africa. I grew up in Nigeria, and uh, I live here now with my, my family, and quite quite excited about what, what actually happens here in the tech, specifically in the angel investing field. Thank you, Ranjit. I'll now hand this over to Duncan. Let me use this one. I'm talking. Trust my luck. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm Donald Nyango. And um, uh, I'm kind of going to be asked. Not too much. Um, the first time is that um, I'm talking to you to build a business and try to attract investment and faith. The second part is that I'm somebody who was doing anything to invest to a business that needed that type of investment. And then the final one, more importantly, I'm wearing the hat as the real director for Achievement Fund. And for those of you who are not familiar with Achievement Fund, we are the poster boy of impact investment. Uh, we started 20 years ago. And uh, to grow, not just as an organization, but also seeing the expansion of the impact investing space. So we are here in New York. Uh, we're present in India, Pakistan, uh, Latin America, Colombia, and in Africa, we are in Ghana, and uh, in Nairobi. So I have the Nairobi team. Uh, we will be doing present in East Africa since 2007. But our first investment in our document was in East Africa in 2001 in a business uh, company uh, in Arusha, Tanzania. Um, over the last seven years, uh, we invested in excess of $30 million in uh, close to 23 uh, companies, early stage investments. Uh, and uh, most of these companies are growing and we're learning a lot about impact investing. Um, we have, in terms of you know, credentials, created close to 45,000 jobs and impacted more than 82 million lives during the last seven years. Uh, we typically invest um, you know, any structure, whether it's debt or equity, um, and the sizes of ranging between 250,000 to 2.5 million dollars uh, in early stage investments. Um, for those who've actually read about, um, read one of our reports called Blueprint to Scale, there's something called the Pioneer Gap, you know, the stage where businesses are looking to validate their, you know, their model, looking to, you know, prepare themselves to, for takeoff. You know, that gap, that is where we are. And, you know, in my understanding of you know, the investing ecosystem, you know, that there's a critical need for an acumen type investor to play a role at that critical stage of a company's in, uh, development. So I will be sharing with you some of my experiences there, and I will link in with the other uh, uh, investors. Thank you. Um, my name is Eric Osiakwan, I'm from Ghana. Uh, I'm an angel by day, uh, then at night uh, I'm an entrepreneur. And then at dawn, I try to uh, pull angels together. Uh, so, so that's sort of the nightmare that I live with. But I love it. It's a lot of fun. Um, I normally do very early stage investing. So if you have an idea, I want to talk to you. So I play in the family, friends, and fools category. Um, 
Um, but I specialize in the technology industry because that's what I know. Uh, I've built a lot of ISPs, internet businesses across uh, 32 countries in Africa. Uh, this is a place where I lived and really built a business. I've lost a couple in Kenya. I love Kenya. I've been coming here for years. Um, but what's very interesting for me is that we're seeing this new energy and unleashing of innovation across the continent. And so I've tried to position myself as somebody who is a bridge. He's a poster boy, but I'm sort of like a bridge between the previous generation of entrepreneurs that brought connectivity to the continent. And then this new energy that is sort of, in my view, creating our own technology. All right. So it's good to have Google and Facebook, but now can we create one? Um, so that generation is the generation that I'm trying to take my experience and a little bit of the money I made from the previous experience to, to sort of help push forward. I also bring a wealth of experience and, and also connectivity globally within the technology ecosystem to a lot of the startups I invest in. Um, I spend a lot of time traveling because angel investing, you have to roll up your sleeves and get in the gutter and get dirty. Um, so I spend a lot of time with the entrepreneurs. I'm physically there. I mean, this year I've already been to four countries. I was in Lagos, Abidjan, Dakar, Cape Verde, and I'm here now. Um, so I spend, I'm actively involved in the process. Sometimes I'm a salesman. Yesterday I was writing sales proposals to people because the, the business has to sell a product. Um, I've, I've started taking on that role because I realized that a lot of entrepreneurs have a great product and they can write the code and they can figure out a few things, but selling the product is a different thing. Right. Um, so sometimes a you know, bit of experience helps. Um, I also help entrepreneurs with um, try to patent their technology. Uh, it's a big challenge in Africa trying to patent technology. Um, but in the West, that's why we see, that's the basis for the big exits that we see. Most of the time, what the companies are being bought, company being bought is not the customer or anything, it's their patent. And it's worth billions. Um, so I've been actively spending time with lawyers trying to understand how to create the right you know, vehicles, where to locate them, how to do it. And I'm trying to sort of help with entrepreneurs. So I'm also learning what else I'm doing. Uh, in my previous slide, which is the ISP world, we didn't create anything new, so we didn't patent anything. <laughs> We're just reselling connectivity on. Right? Um, I also spend a, a, a lot of my time trying to get entrepreneurs to understand that you can have a great idea, um, but you need a team to make it work. So as an entrepreneur, you are very bold and courageous and strong and convinced that you're the superman and you're going to save the world. But you also have to understand that you have limitations. Right? And in those limitations comes the need to work with people and to have co-founders, to have partners, to have employees that you should regard as colleagues. Because without them, that great vision that you have will just be in your head. And the reality is that everybody has a great idea. The difference is those who make it work. Right. So for you to make it work, you have to understand and accept certain realities that we operate in, which is the laws of nature. Um, I also uh, spend quite a bit of time trying to get entrepreneurs, uh, or, or let me step back, the matrix that I normally use uh, is, is three things. So normally if you came to me with an idea, I want to see that um, you, are, you as an entrepreneur have the ability to make it work, or with my support you can make it work. Um, because primarily people invest in people, and it's people that generate ideas. But ideas are worth nothing if there's no market. So the third criteria is I try to figure out whether this idea, there's a market for, will somebody pay for the service? So um, I'll end with sort of what, what we are done, which is trying to build an angel network across Africa. So I founded Angel Africa with Andile in Kaba uh, from South Africa last year, June. Um, and the idea is to try and create a community of uh, investors that can start working together, collaborating, supporting the startup ecosystem. And I think that's very important. Collaboration is really needed. Um, out of that, we sort of begat uh, Angel Fair, which is uh, an activity that, an event that brings entrepreneurs to meet with angel investors to try and do deals. So I think that sets a little bit of the tone. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Rick. And uh, I mean, we seem to have a group of people who have actually done extensive angel investing. Uh, we do have perspectives from, of course, an institutional investor and uh, mainstream angel investors who have done a lot of tech in mobile. Uh, we also have an angel investor who has done extensively uh, impact investing in the past of third. Uh, of course, uh, uh, 
one individual who definitely looks the part of the angel investor with or without the jacket is Eric. <laughs> and uh, given uh, that you have actually co-founded the angel, Africa angel list, and you have extensively interacted with the group of uh, angel investors here, uh, it will be good to understand the nature of these investors. And I mean, we have found uh, investors in India, in US, and, and Europe comprising of a set of individuals who have either been entrepreneurs or who have been uh, part of the investing world at some point. So uh, we wanted to get a flavor of who these investors are that you collaborate with, who are these investors who who are actually taking part. Okay, thank you. So first, let me give a bit of context. Um, in June, when we founded Angel Africa, we, we started at uh, an event at a table with 60 entrepreneurs. And Angelia and myself were the early angels at the table. So that's when we decided, let's, and then we came up with the name. So it was all like starting startup as well, right? And then we found out that, so when, when we came up with the name Angel Africa, then we wanted to set up a domain, so we started Googling, and we found out a group called Africa Angel Network, AAN, started by a guy called Pule Talkoban in New York, who is South African, but worked with investors like, and moved to New York. So there's, there's Africa Angel Network, and we're collaborating, we're hoping to sort of make the two. So I just want, in case you have that in your mind. Um, also, there is a group called Angel Africa in New York, which is a non-profit that looks at leadership uh, and how the diaspora can invest in Africa. And I know that group very well, and so we're still doing some collaboration. Uh, in terms of those who are within our network, um, essentially, um, well, fortunately or unfortunately, we're a little bit biased with technology. So it's predominantly technology entrepreneurs. Um, it's people who have been able to build or exit the technology businesses uh, in some way or another uh, around the continent. Uh, we currently have 77 members, but we're also open to new technology investors. So we have a few non-technology investors. In our last event, we also had some non-technology uh, startups. Sure. So uh, largely comprising of people who have created their wealth through uh, setting up their own enterprise and exiting from that, especially in technology. So Ranjit, uh, you have been doing investing across the world, of course, but uh, largely in uh, India and, and most recently, of course, in Africa. So uh, what is your experience been in Africa? Do you typically collaborate with other investors here? And uh, uh, what do you think of the enterprises that you have found here vis-a-vis -vis some other countries that you've invested in? Uh, so, so to 88 MPH by and by and large is actually uh, is a brand. The the actual funding vehicle is funded by Joe Blows, like people in the in, in the audience. We. We require about six to seven hundred thousand dollars to run a program. I mean, there, there are many gaps in the market which Eric has touched upon, but the ones that we understand is funding. Secondly, we understand there's an entrepreneurship hole, as in how do you how do you, how does an entrepreneur build a business? And thirdly, you know how, how do you get them to 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 build their product and, and to get it out to people? Uh, we realize it's not possible to get institutional money to come in. We need people in these communities to build these companies forward. So we need to take money from them, channel it into building these companies. So 88 in Kenya is actually funded almost completely by Kenyans. So the angels that we that we talk about are actually Kenyan citizens. And, and of course, myself, Creston, who's the founder, uh, we take small amounts of money, 25 to $100,000. My experience here is that generally you're competing with pretty difficult or pretty lucrative asset classes like real estate, the stock market does quite well. So to convince people to, to invest in angel investing, which is in many ways a blood sport, is to actually tell them that, listen, you will make some money. And they usually put money in because of somebody they trust, somebody who understands the business. So I think there is an intent and, and there's a willingness for people to look into this, but there's quite a lot of hand-holding that's required. Um, and to also actually convince them that they can make some money in this because because of the fact that the returns are there. So um, the easiest people to convince are the tech entrepreneurs, people who've done this in the past, they, they seem to understand that. Uh, then there's the other category that has a lot of money and doesn't know what to do with it, but wants to do something interesting for society. And then, you know, generally people, uh, young people, sort of early, early, 40s, late 30s, who, who work in corporate and want to give back to society, this is sort of an interesting way for them to, to come in. So actually, all these categories that I've mentioned are among our 30-odd shareholders uh, who, who've put in uh, capital. 
Great. So, so Ranjit, you've largely said, and even Eric has mentioned that uh, the investors that he collaborates with and the ones that you collaborate with, they're largely African origin. We do see a huge amount of interest from individuals and, in fact, institutions outside Europe and US. And we have Susan amongst this panel, who is, in fact, very keen and looking at Africa for angel investments. So, uh, Susan, can you actually tell us what's pulling you to Africa? And, and what's making you look at Africa as an investment destination? Sure. So I'll talk about myself, and then I'll also talk about the other angels that, that I'm interacting with from Europe and the US. So one is that my angels, our, our group that we hang out with, they might have come from philanthropy, and they want to use for-profit models to really solve some of the problems that they're aiming to in philanthropy. They may be business people who are thinking they'd like to make a transition, and they have enough cash to be an angel, but this is a good way for them to learn about getting into this sector, and they're thinking, I'm investing also to think about how else I can learn. Um, and then you also have people who, again, they've done well in the city, or they've done well by building a business, and they've said, you know, perhaps this is a place where I can make my difference, perhaps it's a place I'm going to want to work, but I want to put capital to work. And if you start to think about the problems that you want to solve, um, and we're looking at healthcare, education, financial inclusion, kind of all the things we've been talking about at San Calp so far, um, you can think about it in a domestic context, wherever you are, but you can also say, is there a business that I'm investing in here that has opportunity? Um, in global markets, or are there ideas from global markets which have a dual potential, like one of the deals that we're looking at right now has a UK context as well as an uh, Africa context, um, or are there ideas coming actually from frontier markets that could really play well in the markets that we're in? And so the motivation is to say, is there innovation that I can learn from? Is there a place where I can play a role where what I know um, whether it's marketing, finance, management, accounting, what, you know, a, a sector area of expertise where I can really bring what I know to the picture to make a real, a real difference. Um, some people are actually saying, look, you know, the UK is not growing at anywhere near the pace as Africa. So if I'm thinking about where do I want to be in the next 20 years, I want to really look at markets that are growing. Um, I have investors that I spend a lot of time with that are focused on women and girls and the issues around women and girls' economic empowerment. And um, of course, when you think about where are the real both need and opportunity, you can't help but be thinking about frontier markets. So that's a place where I think increasingly people are saying, where can I, where are the places I can make a difference? But then there are all also a lot of areas of trepidation about, um, gee, if I'm going to invest here, uh, how do I really know what's really going to help the community or what's really going to get traction? How do I know the difference between an entrepreneur who's gotten an award and recognition uh, from a competition versus an entrepreneur who's really going to build a solid business? Um, and how do I know about the, how do I think about political risk? How do I think about uh, sort of all the other kinds of risks? So there, there's both excitement and there's also trepidation, which we can talk more about. Great, Susan. So, so you, uh, having heard what you said, you are looking at an ecosystem to actually provide you a lot of uh, uh, comfort for investing to come through from others from Europe and US as well. Uh, what I also hear is growth, innovation, and uh, uh, impact are probably three large factors that are actually pulling a lot of angel investors overseas into Africa. Now, just a follow-up question on that, and then I come to you, Duncan. Uh, but before that, Eric and Ranjit, uh, would you like to collaborate with a lot of overseas investors and angel networks and angel clubs that are there outside who now have a very strong interest in Africa? And how do you see, see that collaboration playing out? And how do you address some of those risks that uh, risks and concerns that Suzanne has also alluded to uh, while collaboration, while collaborating with them? Um, somebody invested in me. So on a Saturday afternoon in New York, I walked into this office and a lady opens the door. And uh, we talked for 45 minutes and she wrote me a check of $5,000 and she said, I think you will be successful and I wish you the best of luck. And her name is Esther Dyson. So she was the first person to invest in me because I went and pitched an idea and she, she taught me two, two lessons. One is people invest in people. And people make ideas work. And those are the foundations of my investing life. 
So talking about people, I always believe that it's about people in the sense of a team for a business, but also people in the sense of a community. Right. So um, I, I'm, I've done some investments in, I've not done real collaboration and syndication yet, but it's something I'm really open up to um, uh, because uh, as I alluded to, um, we all have our great strengths, but we have our great weaknesses. Um, so you may have money, um, but somebody may have a sector knowledge about, like I'll give you an example. When I was in Cape Verde, I, I met, there was an exhibition, so there was a startup that had done a games uh, startup called Bonaco. And then I met a gentleman called Ping uh, from Singapore, uh, Ping Ben who is an investor. So we were talking and we went to, we met at the startup. He's invested in games, game companies before. And he just, within 45 minutes, taught me a whole matrix that is used to make those kinds of investments. Right? And I've never done that kind of investment before. And I was just learning for the 45 minutes that we spoke. Right? I have my matrix about what I invested. So there's always need for collaboration. So you do see the need for collaboration and uh, you do see that happening in some time. Sure. Um, I mean, as I mentioned before, I think the three tenets to making things successful here, you know, the, the capital, the entrepreneurship, and then, so sorry, the, 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 the mentorship, and, and also being able to give a market to for these products to survive. I don't think there's any lack of people wanting to come to Africa, but, you know, angel investing is a bit like, you know, once bitten, twice shy. So if, if you can't get it to work, then people don't really want to come back. And, and that's actually, I think, the biggest challenge we have. We don't have enough successes here where people are standing up and waving their hands and saying, yes, I want to put money down. Who can I talk to? This has happened now in India and some of the other developing markets where you've had blockbuster companies. You know, you've had billion dollar companies, about five billion dollar companies in India, tech companies that have come up. We don't really have any here in Africa. That's very important. Then I think the second part of it is actually the, the entrepreneurs that are there, like Eric, need to give back more because we are the people that understand. I mean, I'm an entrepreneur, I understand that what that risk is. How do you quantify that? You need to then go out and syndicate and convince people this is a good idea. I've got you know exceptionally bright people that, that I've met now over the last year between here, Cape Town, and, and Lagos. And when I say bright, I mean really bright because they're developing products that I've not seen in Europe but they can't find money because people don't understand what they're doing. How do you bridge that gap? You can't go to Europe and convince people. I mean, it, it's, 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 it's something that people like myself, Eric, have to go out and syndicate on their behalf to convince the world that this works. You know, I'm putting down $10,000 or $50,000, and that's about the only way we can raise money. What happens when we raise funding for 88? We need six to $700,000 to run a program where we're able to invest in five to 10 companies every year. It's usually because I put down quite a lot of money, Crescent put down, puts down quite a lot of money, that's what we did earlier. We don't need to do it anymore. Now people come back because they see the companies, they come for our demo days, they meet our, 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 our companies, they see 88 and these companies that we've invested on, TechCrunch, on VentureBurn. So, so more and more people are actually coming, it's, it's a lot easier for us, but it's still very hard for the, for the actual um, companies themselves. And, and that actually happens when, People take a risk and, and people take a punt. And it's not people from outside, it's people here first. Then we can go out. So you've touched upon a very important point, Ranjit, uh, syndication of deals. And I have seen from interactions that, uh, that from an operating model perspective, the angel networks here operate in a very different way as opposed to how they operate in the US, Europe, or in India. It seems like angel investing happens on an individual basis and not so in groups which is very, very different from how it happens in other countries. We will, I think, come back to that uh, uh, in terms of collab and touch upon collaboration once again. But just, just before that, uh, I want to ask Duncan the question on the pipeline. So we have a huge interest from international investors, domestic investors, and a lot of angel networks and angel clubs, and even fairs that have been created to showcase enterprises. So do we have enough pipeline? Do we have enough enterprises that investors can actually invest in? And if we talk about the availability of the pipeline, then do institutional investors see angel investing as part of that ecosystem and as an integral part of that ecosystem at all? So, Duncan, I mean, you look for businesses that have possibly been validated or not been validated. You are looking at early stage investing. So, how much comfort will an enterprise that has been invested into by an angel or a group of angels give you when you're looking at your pipeline? I think um, uh, it will give me a lot of comfort. 
Um, and maybe it's, it's good to just look at you know the types of companies. When we talk about early stage companies, what are the sort of things that um, you know that um, uh, we encounter? Um, I always look at it in, in two ways. Uh, when going into a, into a deal, I, have, you know, I want to make sure that I can price that deal. And uh, if I can't, you know, if I'm having difficulties primarily because there's a lot of unknowns, um, then you know, it becomes it becomes problematic, and that probably is something that puts off a number of investors. Um, businesses at the very early stage of the development where the, the model is, is not has not yet been proven, maybe there's not a firm understanding of the marketplace or even a, a, a you know um, a great development of the proposition means that. You know, we're assuming a lot of things. Um, but if, if um, an angel or somebody who understands how to build and develop businesses has done their part, then that gives me a lot of faith and also makes it, uh, enables me to properly, um, you know, price that deal, uh, go into it with great understanding of what risks I'm taking and, uh, you know, what it will take to, to scale it. Um, so, the challenge for our industry is to move from the transaction-based view of the world to more of an ecosystem, appreciating the efforts and the inputs and the investment that has come before. Um, and I believe that, you know, as a, as a, a major player uh, in this market, that, you know, um, my, my ability to generate pipeline uh, will be enhanced by everybody playing their part. And I, I also need to examine what role um, I have to play in ensuring that you know, uh, those who are taking earlier, stage, earlier risks than I am uh, are able to, you know, to, uh, to, uh, to do the investments. Um, so, so we've been having um, you know, a discussion um, um, which has been um, uh, facilitated by Andy in terms of how we can develop um, an ecosystem framework um, where everybody plays a part, incubators, accelerators, angels, you know, early stage investors, you know, and uh, and uh, series B and series C investors being able to you know to uh, you know to um, to, um, to play the the proper role uh, in the investing space. Um, one of the risks. Duncan, can you say who Andy is? Um, Andy is the, um, uh, an acronym for Aspen Network of Development Partners, I believe. That's what it is. Andy? And entrepreneurs, that's it. You know, sometimes I, I struggle with uh, some of the acronyms. Um, and uh, and we, you know, we, you know, we are, we are uh, a member of Andy, and I think Andy are present uh, in this forum today. Uh, so they've been, you know, they've, they've over the last year uh, set up a work, a work group to look at how we can, you know, establish a, a framework, um, an ecosystem, uh, to enable, you know, an ecosystem view of, of investing in East Africa. Um, there's, there's a, a characterization of the of the of the of this space. I mean, we, to be honest, we all, we all look at the same deal. Um, I bet you all the investors in this place are all looking at the same deal. Um, and I can now say that you know, over the last one year, um, because we look at partnerships and collaborations as a strategic aspect of our work, we've seen the result of that. I have a very healthy pipeline. Uh, but within my pipeline, uh, there is some investment that we'll probably be looking at for maybe another two years. Um, but having discussions now, you know, giving direction uh, and, and enabling the business to begin to think and begin to form itself in a way that will actually make it possible for me to invest in them. Thank, thank you. So what I heard was if you didn't have an enterprise A, uh, which did not have an angel investor at Enterprise B, which did have one with exactly the same strength and promote their end of business model, then you would more likely be comfortable with Enterprise B with the angel investor mm -hmm. rather than Enterprise A, which which does provide comfort. Additionally, what you said is it, you do need an entire ecosystem of players. You do need facilitators, you do need incubators, accelerators, advisors, you do need every stage of investor. Seed stage, main angel stage, impact, as well as series A, series B, and then the P investors as well. So in our conversation, Susan, we did speak about sequencing of investors and stacking of investors. 
So we have spoken about the need for an angel investor to find a series A investor be able to exit to or possibly a series B investor to exit to. And the need for different stages of investors to be vibrant in an ecosystem. Uh, in certain cases, of course, we do have investors stacked together in the same company. Now, how have we seen that being laid out in national markets? And so I want to bring in some other actors into the picture so we can think about what is the role of philanthropy, what's the role of a corporate, what's the role of a DFI, um, and thinking, and the angels and the VCs, so really thinking about that whole picture. And if you've got a, a company that's got potentially great social impact but really has to go through a lot of, you know, successive versions of their business model, testing, piloting, R&D, it's great if you can have philanthropy at the front end. And that philanthropy could be corporate philanthropy, it could be coming from an accelerator or incubator funded by a DFI or by a corporate or individual angels. It could be funded by foundation grants. Um, but oftentimes it's great to have that sort of grant in the sequencing side. You know, grants come in, sometimes angels will come in, uh, or friends, family, and fools, as people say, but um, oftentimes it's great if there's grant money there that can then lead to either more grant plus now uh, convertible debt from an angel um, or any of these other kinds of players, which can then lead to now getting equity um, and adding in, could be angels co-investing with VCs. Um, the, again, philanthropy, which was really viewing themselves earlier on as just purely on the grant side now. Philanthropy is really looking at themselves as mission-related investors who can also be using money out of their corpus or money out of program-related investments to be an investor. Um, and that's really come up in the last 10 years. So I'm, I'm involved with a network of foundations which are really looking at mission-related investing, not just using their grants, but very definitely using their investment. And I know that some are here. Um, and so who can play along that sequence as the company gets de-risked and as the company then needs more and more money to scale? That's one aspect of looking at it. The other is stacking. So where you could say, is there a philanthropist or a player that's willing to take a first loss position? Um, and then another investor who says, well, I'm, in, I'm excited about this, but I, I'd rather sort of go for lower risk and lower potential return. And then another investor who says, look, I want that. I'll, I'll take the riskiest position, but then I want the best potential return opportunity. Um, the key is aligning expectations and being really clear about what your motivations are and making sure that if you've got people co-investing, whether it's co-investing with grants and debt and equity, or co-investing in terms of um, just into the same deal, that people's motivations and expectations are clear and aligned, and that the entrepreneur's expectations around that capital are clear and aligned. So one of the places where it really goes wrong is if either the entrepreneur doesn't get what kind of capital is coming in and what that expectation is, or if the investors, if you bring in three different kinds of investors, and one is, I'm just aiming for a quick flip, someone else is saying, I want to really grow it, someone else is saying, I'm really there for the social impact, someone else is there saying, I want to, I want to really be there for some other motivation, that that's where things really get messed up. But the, I think what's exciting, and what we're seeing a lot in London and the US at least, is these collaborations and uh, and the benefit from these different kinds of capital and different kinds of uh, characteristics and, and ability to move and bring in, again, successive layers of capital um, can really come to the fore. And I, and I think in an African context, this is going to be absolutely critical. Um, and that, again, depending on what kind of enterprise you're trying to grow, we've got this opportunity now, since it's, it's, uh, it's in a way a really open field, to be building it with some of the lessons learned that we've had from uh, these other markets. Great. Uh, so sequencing and uh, so sequencing and stacking of investors. What's very clear is uh, is that different investors come with uh, colors of capital, color of capital that's very different, and it's quite important that the the alignment across the different investors with the entrepreneur and the business as well. And what is uh, very clear is there is a lot of collaboration that does happen in international markets, uh, especially at early stage when it comes to investing. 
What we have uh, heard is from operating model perspective, we have seen a lot of informal collaboration happen even within Kenya and Africa. And I have heard uh, you talk about Chamas, who have basically been investing in groups. And the way I hear it, it seems like the formal networks that today invest in technology in mobile do it more on an individual basis. But historically, there has been a tradition of people investing in groups. Uh, Duncan, can you throw some perspective on this? And uh, we can then take that forward and see if there are some learning. Uh, yes, indeed. Um, and I've had some experience with that. I think uh, for those who are familiar uh, you know, with the kind of context, uh, there are chamas which are investment clubs. Uh, and these are groups of people, whether they're school, you know, school friends, uh, girlfriends, uh, you know, whatever it is that brings it together. Uh, just being able to, uh, you know, uh, collect uh, some money, some funds, whether on a monthly basis or on a basis, and then, you know, uh, invest in that money. Um, one very good example is, for some, some of you who are familiar uh, with the hotel industry, there's a hotel uh, very close to a uh, narrow stadium called Mvuli House. And I was actually privy to this. When Mvuli House was being uh, developed, uh, you know, the guys, the promoters of that particular business actually got uh, the uh, uh, channels to actually come and, and pitch. Um, you know, for, uh, actually, they pitched in front of a number of channels. And the first investment that went into Mvuli House uh, were, were, were actually uh, a group of, uh, of, um, of, of channels. And, and Mvuli House has now uh, grown, I think they've got about two or three uh, you know, uh, extra establishments. So that just gives you an indication of, of uh, you know, the types of uh, of um, of uh, you know, uh, groups that are that are coming up. Um, uh, uh, the, the, a, a lot of the channels, that, you know, some of them now do have a uh, play, you know, actively play an active role in, in the stock exchange. Others tend to prefer, you know, property development and you know buying land and then buying property. Uh, but there are uh, instances of syndications, you know, uh, individuals coming together. And I've had experience of that. Uh, medical, a medical establishment with five outlets requiring cash. You know, a group of doctors coming together, uh, uh, you know, uh, putting money. Together and buying out the you know the uh, the previous owners of that business and and and, uh, and using that as a platform you know to grow the business so those are you know these things are happening in this particular market um, and chamas are chamas are here to stay uh, and they're actually having a very very active they play a very critical role in in, 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 in the investment space. Okay, so what's unique about chamas more seems to be that they do have a lot of local context and uh, mostly have relationships with each other already. They know each other. And uh, Eric, from what I heard uh, uh, from you yesterday, it seems like you're translating uh, some of this into angel investing by creating these local groups in specific places in Lagos, in Inakra, in Chogo, in various other places across Africa. So you do see the benefit of having groups who do relate to each other and who do understand each other and invest together in, in groups. So can you talk a little bit about what you view a little bit? Okay. You know, I've done this before, so I'm just following an old script. Uh, when I did the ISP uh, consultant with ISPs, I started the Ghana ISP Association, and then I founded the African ISP Association. And then, but this time I founded Angel Africa List, which is of the Africa group. Um, but I'm part of the Ghana Angel Network, which I didn't start, but I joined uh, because I know Angel Investors locally. I'm in the group from a minute and day we started uh, Lagos Angel Network Land, which is a network of angel investors. But the idea is to try and push for angel networks across different countries. So when I was in Senegal, um, I was uh, meeting with some angels. I actually invested in a company in Senegal uh, this last year, which is where I was there partly. But also trying to use it as a to sort of push the angel because I I'm investing from Ghana, so I'm also an angel who also invests, and then we can we can be buddies and we can sort of help out. Um, um, and, and so part of our approach with Indofair is to try and use it to achieve two, two purposes. One is to create a forum for deals to happen, but secondly to sort of push for a local agenda. So our next event is in Lagos. So we're partnering with the Lagos Angel Network and the Africa Venture Capital Association to host the uh, Angel for West Africa. 
the idea is to go to Lagos, so prop up the Indian network there, bring up the angels from Ghana, hopefully bring up some angels from Senegal, bring some angels from the international community from East Africa. Uh, I know it did NPH is setting up and Pusuabu, so we should chat a little bit about if you, know, you guys are ready enough to collaborate. But the idea is to use it as a vehicle to then get the Indian community in Lagos to be more active, right, and to also collaborate in, and have some visibility to angel activities in other countries, right. And the view is that that will, for example, propel the angels that we bring from Senegal to go back and say, okay, we need to set up a uh, Senegal angel network. Right? Um, so, so that's sort of the agenda which we're, 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 I'm trying to achieve. Um, but we also partnered with the Africa Venture Capital Association with a vertical agenda because, as angels, we want to see that there are, um, you know, VCs and private equity guys at the value chain who will then do the follow-on investment. Right? Otherwise, then you have to invest and you have to keep investing and then you run out of money and then the startup dies. <laughs> um, and in the same way, the VCs and the private equity guys will tell you they're having a deal for problem because they cannot have visibility what's happening down the value chain. Um, so the, the third you know, agenda with this meeting is to try and create some visibility within that vertical value chain as well. And so you have to go this way, horizontal, and you have to go also vertical. Can I ask a question? Sure. Yeah, and, and, uh, yeah. <laughs> we have one so, last question before we throw, throw it. Okay, you, no, you go and then I'll, I have a question for you. I also have a comment. <laughs> <laughs> so we both need to come and have a question. So, so my comment is a little bit more controversial. I apologize in advance. So, so the grants, which is I think partially why a lot of people hear that, is actually fairly insignificant and actually counterproductive to angel investing in Africa. So that's my view. <laughs> We can chat about it a little bit. I say that because grants has created this sort of mentality, specifically in Kenya, which I've not seen in other parts, like in Nigeria and some of the other countries, where there is nothing to give back. A grant is a grant. I take it and I walk away. You haven't taken anything from me. You haven't taken my money. You haven't taken my children. No equity. I have no obligation to you. I see you in six months. I tell you about the Congress. When it runs out, I make another application for some more money. That does not create entrepreneurs. What it does, it creates lazy boards. It creates people where they expect us to give you money. We don't need that. We don't need people to stand up and give us money. We want people to believe in us and give us money because they want to think we're going to make money for them. That's the only way this works. There is no two ways about this discussion. You never saw this in the so, so that's my view. No, I, I know you made your point, and, and, and this is actually where the dichotomy starts in, in most of the emerging markets. There are good ideas, don't get me wrong, that have been funded in. And this is a good example. Did it put some money into that many years ago? That is, that is, but it's not an entrepreneur's dream, it's still a product that's run by a big corporate company. And to get good guys to come out of this, I think people need to take something back. When we give money, we need to make sure that you get something back. And that's the principle. As an angel, I never invest in companies that have taken grant money. I just refuse to do it because that for me is people that don't wake up in the morning worrying about how they're going to make the ends meet the next day. It's, it's a principle. It's, you know, it's, it's, I also work in tech because companies I invest in typically die at the end of the year. So if they die, I run they die and put in more money so that they, they, they move on to the next uh, uh, sort of question. So I mean, I had to liven it up a little bit. So my question to you was what was the last message to the entrepreneur? So I think we'll just hand that. So. <laughs> okay, so I want to tell a story about a company in the States called Revolution Foods. How many of you have ever heard of Revolution Foods? No, a few. Okay, so here's a company where I met them when they were at a business plan competition coming out of Berkeley. Um, and I, they were looking for $50,000. And I was at Investor Circle at the time. I'm on a screening committee. I'm reading their plan. And I said, boy, they want to reinvent uh, healthy food in the schools. They want to really think about uh, the nutrition side. They want to think about what's going on in cafeterias in schools. They want to think about affordability. This is like two young women, very dynamic, coming out of business school with a great idea and absolutely no proof or evidence that this could go anywhere. So you're either going to get an angel who's going to say, look, I'm perfectly happy to just assume that I'm going to lose all my money. Or in the case of Revolution Foods, you're going to get some grants, which are going to give them the, the room. These were very entrepreneurial women. Just giving them the breathing room 
to go out and demonstrate, build their business plan, go out and do some pilots, demonstrate what was really there. Now today, this is a company which has uh, went from grant to angel to venture to now huge venture, and they're just, they're rocking it. I mean, they're so on fire. Um, but if somebody had said at the beginning, this is gonna either live or die based on some tech angel who's gonna decide to put his money in or not, I'm sorry, that was never gonna happen. Okay, so they never said about that. <laughs> Well, so the point that I wanted to make is that look, if you are an entrepreneur, you, you solve a problem and somebody is going to pay you for that problem with the customer. It's very important for everyone who supports this ecosystem to drive down that fundamental principle. So in your business, you have an idea, the idea solves a problem, and so somebody is willing to pay you for solving that problem. So as a business, you must wake up every day thinking about the customer. How can I solve this better? How can I make life better so that person can pay me? Uh, my view is that that is what the entrepreneur must fundamentally be thinking about every day. Right? If you have some donor funding, good luck. If you have some investment, fine. I'll give you an example. I'm here, I managed to co-opt one of my startups, uh, SMSGH here. I like to somewhere around, but he's, he's just, he's cutting deals. But he started this company, um, so when I started, I invested in me, I started a company called Ghana New Ventures Competition, where we mentor startups, and he came into that program uh, 12 years ago. After college, he was so fired after college, he started his own company. The company they started in the competition died and started SMSG. Today, it's a $3 million company providing value added service, services in Ghana with zero investment, no debt, no debenture, nothing. Probably the mindset is, wake up in the morning, think about the customer. You have one customer, make him so happy that he brings the next customer. Make the next customer so I bring the next customer. It's a hard road, but the reality is that in Africa, that's the mindset you must have, because really, there are, are not a lot of angels. And then when there are more angels and all that stuff, you should see them as an add-on. Right? So this is one of the messages that I drive to entrepreneurs that is very, very fundamental and very important. I've earned my right to reply. I've I, I earned the disagreement right now. Uh, no, 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 you shouldn't leave, actually. I think you should hear this. Um, the thing is that the reality is uh, that uh, the wrong businesses that have been founded uh, using grant money, we cannot escape from that. The question we've got to ask ourselves is, is that when I come in as an investor, um, you know, my role is to ensure that the, the business or that investment transitions, you know, from dependent, you know, being dependent on grant to moving on. Uh, and, and I, I, you know, we, we, we are currently uh, invested in a, in a sanitation business, and, you know, they've, got, they've been able to get a lot of grants. But the question we're asking the, at the board is, you know, what is your plan to move away from grants yeah. into, you know, uh, attracting more commercial types of, in, uh, of, uh, of investment? Primarily because running after grants can be, can be very distracting. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the, the, the management will, will, will forever be, you know, in conferences such as this, uh, all over the world trying to attract grants rather than focusing on the business. So I agree with my colleague here, Eric, that it's about, you know, the source of funding uh, is not that important, but dependent, being dependent on, uh, on grants can be distracting. And, um, but we have to acknowledge the fact that these kinds of funding exist, they're there for a purpose, and that they can be quite catalytic uh, in in uh, in um, you know in, in these types of of, um, of investment, some of these bu some of these businesses, you know, for you to be able to prove the model, you need risk-free capital, and maybe grants is the way to go. So uh, I think we'll let the panel debate outside of the uh, <laughs> on whether we need to take grants or not. So uh, we have to throw this open to the f for question and answers. You want a mic? You are going to let me ask Eric my question at some point. No, um, this is a question to Suzanne. Uh, my name is Ken, but I'm uh, actually going back to the front. Um, Suzanne, I just wanted to ask you a question of what is it that 
external investors would like to see so they can increase their activity and I know we talked about appetite earlier on. Um, so what sort of things are you looking for once you give your money? Okay, so the question is what are angels looking to see, right? So, you know, similarly to Eric, and my angels are impact angels, right? So they're, they want to see a real, a, a great entrepreneur and a great team. They want to see a, a real problem that needs to be solved and not just an entrepreneur who's come up with a solution looking for a problem. They want to see uh, that there's really market demand and that this angel has relent, this uh, investor, this entrepreneur has relentlessly gone and understood the market. So that they've actually really, you know, you talked about, you know, spending a lot of time flying around. You know, I like it when I hear that an uh, entrepreneur has gone and spent a lot of time in the market with customers, with, uh, you know, people who really are, they're really out to serve to understand what they're, what they're looking for. Um, we also want to know that uh, there's the creativity and the resilience um, that if, you know, these three things don't work, that somebody's going to bounce back. So that they're, and emotional intelligence we're looking for, not just kind of raw technical intelligence. Um, and we're looking for, does this person have a way to articulate the impact that they're going for? Uh, and to be able to say, look, these are three things I know I have to do well, including what is the social or environmental impact? What is the problem I'm trying to solve? And how am I going to look at that? And, it, and, and that they're going to be looking at their labor relationships, their, how they treat their employees, their customers, how they're building an ecosystem of support around their business, who their advisors are. Um, and they really want to see that there is that network of support. So if I'm looking at somebody who's relatively early stage, I'm, I want to know what do people in the market think about them and who's showing up to help them if they call. Um, from, uh, from a relationship with somebody that's a, like if we're sitting in London and we're saying we really want to co-invest with somebody in Kenya, we also really want to see that there is uh, that local network so that the Eric is going to show up and really coach that person if they need coaching. Or that a lawyer is going to show up and you know be there for legal advice. Or that a, um, somebody on, who really understands distribution in that particular market is going to be there. Because we may not be able to. So we, we, we really want to know that there's a good partner. And the trust, somebody mentioned the trust thing. We want to know from an investor to investor standpoint that this is someone that we can really get on with, really trust, and that when things go wrong, because they always will, uh, you know, how is everybody going to react? Um, and who's really in it also for the long haul? And it's, and it's this complicated question about the, you know, how soon do you let something go if it's not working? Um, versus how, how long do you stay with something that's not working? And different people have different approaches to that. And sometimes you really do have to let something go, even though you love the idea, or you love the person, or you love the problem they're trying to solve. But sometimes, actually, the key is to stay with it if you're really trying to aim for social impact. I'm not talking about a tech, just a sort of tech venture that's out there to just do like the next cool thing. I'm talking about something which is really aiming to solve a social problem. Um, that sometimes you have businesses that you stick with for 10 years, and then it's an overnight success, and it really takes off. There's, there's companies in our space where that's much more typical. And, and to have patient capital that's there saying, OK, if I really want this social aim to be achieved, uh, I want to know that there's other patient capitalists sitting alongside me. There's something coming to Lagos, the Lagos India Fair, and I'm still going to base my other comment on the Lagos Angel, Angel Fair. It's it's a, a long time coming. It's something we're really need in that space in Lagos, Nigeria. And coming from the grant aspect, I work sorry, I work with the Charles Foundation, the focus on youth and female entrepreneurship, or female empowerment through entrepreneurship. And then we realize that grants really won't work in Africa because we're largely, so far, we're largely dependent on grants. Different grants, we have grants from Europe, grants from UK, grants from US, and really it's not working, because the beneficiaries get these grants and they have problems to solve at home, they have school fees to pay, they have things and that, they have wives to marry, you know, and all that, so they die back the grants. But in the US, coming from where everything is there, there's food, there's water, there's all the basic necessities available, anybody that's coming for a grant wants to really put it in a business and I want something to 
<laughs> but here in Africa, we, the basics, we need to solve those ones first. For thinking about the business. And we're going to business to make money. We have money for me, so I can make those basics. So the grand thing, I, I'll stick with um, that guy, what he's saying. Thinking about angel investment. Angel investment is, I think, the perfect thing in the world for Africa. Hand rolling throughout the whole process, get my investment ready for the VCs and the P and the other. So, so we'll be very happy to follow up with you. Um, Nigeria has a lot of wealthy people, so we need a lot of money for it to start up. And I think that will jumpstart Nigeria's economy. Uh, as you know, a lot of statistics today point to Nigeria as a very pivotal engine uh, for the 21st century, so there's no doubt about that. The other point I want to make is that, so in the investment, there's money, but so from my experience is that there's a lot to give that money. A lot of startups just don't have experience. So one of the things that we need to also accommodate, and Africa is uh, it's a big problem, it's failing. Right? We need to allow some startups to fail, and a lot of them fail very quickly, and then really themselves. The second lesson that I didn't talk to me was make a new mistake. So there's no problem making mistakes, just don't make the old mistake you made yesterday. So one of the things I'm trying to do is make sure these startups don't make the mistakes I made. I mean, I've been in states in Kenya, I've lost money, but I still come with some land, you know, and, and it can help. So, um, oh, I think that it'd be good for us to sort of also create an environment and share their failure experiences. And, and we always use that as a benchmark to help the next level entrepreneurs not to make the same mistakes, but also to, you know, to step up the game and make new mistakes um, going forward. Thanks, Eric. So, we have time for one, two more questions. Hi, um, my name is Michael. I run a business in Uganda called Tugende, and we finance motorcycles for motorcycle taxi drivers. And I wanted to ask the angel investors, what are you investing in, or what are your friends investing in outside of tech? Because what I'm hearing is, okay, you have to fail fast, you don't want any grants, you can make a huge return or not, but it's all tech. What are angels looking at besides that? Because I'd love to get more African investors involved, but I'm having the same problem. People are like, well, we could make an angel investment, or we could buy a plot of land and subdivide it and resell it, and the returns are very high. So what are angels looking at, and what are they thinking about beyond tech? Um, because I think that was part of this panel, non-tech angel investment. So great, great question, and uh, uh, I will actually first ask Ranjit to respond because my question to him was what would actually make Ranjit and the group of angels that he's collaborating with uh, and second of course to Eric to make them look at enterprises that create impact and uh, of course there's one key message that he has already communicated in terms of what he's expecting of entrepreneurs but uh, broadly speaking outside of tech what else can actually make you start looking at uh, enterprises that create impact sure. so, so when I talk about tech I'm, I'm not talking about Facebook or Google Te technology today is the actual great gap closer. That's that's the single biggest thing that has actually changed the way people live in Africa, people live in the US, everywhere, all around the world. That is actually bridging the gap economically, but also from a social and a lifestyle perspective. So when I say we make investments in tech, I mean I'm not talking about a website, or I'm talking about technology that helps, improves lives, and actually takes things forward. So, so you were mentioning finance startups, for example. Sorry, finance. We have actually invested in finance startups, but using technology platforms for distribution. So, so there are investors here who are actually very keen, a lot of the angels that understand finance, but don't understand the technology platform. However, they know how to sell those packages. In Kenya, there's quite a few people in the insurance, banking industry, who actually appreciate the model of where they're beginning to sell because of the other elements of the investor. I mean, if, if you can develop a model tomorrow where you can do unsecured lending in your own for two dollars per person, you'd make a lot of money. So that's not really a technological innovation. That is actually innovation on how you lend it to people without actually doing a credit profile check. So, so there are a lot of angels, I think. The, the issue, quite frankly, is how do you get to these angels? How do you actually know what their interests are? Um, I've seen different things in different parts of the world. 
in India, as, as, uh, as Atri was mentioning, we don't have actually clubs to do that. Uh, that doesn't exist in most of Africa. We've, we've got more uh, medical school to do. There's a few flavors of that in Kenya. Um, but I actually don't, honestly, I don't really want to see an angel. So when I see a serious angel, somebody who's got 20 guys in eyes, that's put away a video, they were invested in something, that's not just there now. Um, but I think the key to this, to get this going, honestly, is to, to cultivate relationships. And the other thing is, as an entrepreneur, you should realize is, nobody gives you money the first time you meet them. You need to meet them a few times, you need to convince them, they like to see a bit of progress. There is a little bit of lack of patience also in the entrepreneur side here in, in, in Africa. You need to understand that it takes time to, to get somebody to, 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 to give you money. So there are tons of agents, is, is what I'm saying, but you still have to be able to convince them that they can trust you to give you the money. Plus, as I mentioned before, you have to actually show that you can deliver some profits from that. So yes, you have to be able to show a business case that's better than taking a plot of land and breaking it up into five pieces. I mean, otherwise you should go to land business, frankly. So what you hear is technology is synonymous with innovation and innovation, so it's not just IT and commerce, but innovation applied to any problem which can bring about growth and profitability in the business and that can attract the angels. So, um, so uh, I, Eric. So I want to really congratulate um, IntelliCab because I was quite impressed with the startups that were judged. I mean, for the first time, I was in a panel judging startups that were not predominantly technology startups or technology businesses or using some form of technology, but were mostly agriculture, renewable energy. So that was, I don't know if it's by design, but I think that you guys did a terrific job. And, and so that also shows that there are a lot of more startups. I mean, I'm a big fan of Continental who went yesterday, right? But I, I just sat in it. When he presented, I was, I was learning. I couldn't believe that somebody could take waste and create such incredible stuff. Right. So this also helps with people realizing that there are other startups and, and what you do in Uganda is terrific. I mean, I'd like, I like to hear a little bit more about your startup and understand the, the, the space a little bit more. I like to learn. I, I don't know it. Um, and I think that in our first event, we also had uh, solar energy businesses, a lot of them in this uh, run as well. We had some farm, smart farm from South Africa. Uh, in the Lagos business, uh, in, uh, event that we're going to do, we are bring the startups from here, six of them. And I was happy that we all met non-tech uh, startups. So again, it's a chicken and egg situation. So one way, so bring more non-tech startups and then angels will sort of, non-tech angels will show up or the tech angels will begin to pay some attention to um, uh, the non-tech uh, startup. But, but um, underlining all this is technology is a gap closer. So it doesn't matter what industry you are in, technology is an enabler. And so it's a factor that I look for uh, if I'm going to do some non-tech uh, investment. So we've got a new group of angels looking at impact investing now. <laughs> Before I end, I think we've got the, I mean, the session has got really started. I understand that Susanna is coming. Okay. So I don't want to leave this without saying something about women. So Eric, what percentage of the angels that you hang out with are women? Five percent? Two percent? It's very hard. Zero percent? Yeah, that's a hard question so to here's, answer. Here's the thing I really here's the thing I really For the first time I couldn't answer a question. That's good. So you have an opportunity, which is an unbelievable opportunity, which is to get women into this picture as angel investors in Africa from the, you're, you're just at the front end of building an angel culture here, you're just at the front end of creating a marketplace, to bring women in from the beginning to recognizing that the men just as much as the women need to learn how to become an angel investor. So there's a lot of need for investor readiness as much as investment readiness, right? But to take advantage of the fact that you have 50% of the population that has the smarts, that has the experience, that has the passion, that has the understanding of the markets that you're trying to serve, by the way, um, that can add value to the companies um, and can really change the dynamic of how we support these companies um, and to create wealth also, uh, that this is a moment that you have a choice that you can make about inviting women into that conversation and that women, by the way, have a choice about showing up in that conversation or not. And so I just didn't want to leave this conversation without saying if I, there was one thing I would hope for as your, you know, as we might start working together, it's to really be thinking about that.
So, great, Susan. I think uh, you also need to probably start off a lot more Intel ICAD. <laughs> we have we've always had a ratio which is skewed a little more towards women. We now have 52% women as opposed to 48 men, and we have almost had that the last seven years. So, we are a huge supporter for women, and especially women in entrepreneurship. And I think uh, there is ample proof here at Sankalp Forum itself. Uh, I would have loved to have one last comment from everyone here on the panel. Unfortunately, I'll be thrown out if I take up any further time. Kanika is just waiting to uh, close the panel here. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for your patience. Thank you. And uh, I'll let Kanika. Thank you so much, panelists. Uh, Suzanne, just to add that we've made sure that every panel at Sankalp has at least one woman. <laughs> That's our contribution. Uh, Atya, can I request you to please hand out a uh, small token of applause?